The Lord was very kind to me this afternoon to encourage me. Um, isn't it remarkable that a, a letter would come to me in the mail just five hours before the service, which is a card, and probably the, the woman who sent it to me is in this room right now, so I won't, I won't mention her name. I don't want to embarrass her at all. just want her to know how much it encouraged me, and I want you to share in the encouragement because um, I'll just read you one sentence here. She said... Um, my first time there was at Bethlehem was Easter Saturday. Oh, that's this service, and if you're watching this the night before, um, Easter Saturday, 2009, and by God's grace, I kept coming back even though I thought I was finished with God. Somewhere in the weeks following Easter, Jesus really got my heart. So I am aware that at Easter time, people who are just about finished with God uh, show up, and maybe we'll give him one more, one more chance, and I'm thankful that you're here, if, if that's true of you tonight. I'm really, really thankful that you're, you're willing to do one more service, and perhaps this would be yours like it was hers two years ago. Now, here's my goal in, in this message. My aim is that you, and I mean all of you, would experience Jesus. It's, it's experiential goals, not merely a information goal. I would like you to experience Jesus, the sovereign, risen, living Lord of the universe as the source and the content of your real freedom. That's my goal. That you would experience Jesus, the living, risen Lord of the universe as the source and the content of your real hope. Now, for that to happen, uh, two things are needed. We need God's liberating truth. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And we need God's liberating grace, because lots of people hear truth and nothing happens. We need truth from God. He's the one who defines truth, not me. And we need grace, this power. And so what I have to have now is I have to have for you a word from God. I have to, I have to find a way not to make it up, but to be faithful to the book so that a word of truth comes to you. So that's what I need at this moment. And I need to speak with the power of the Holy Spirit, because if I just talk in my own strength, then that will go one in one ear and, and out the other. So that means we need a text and a faithful allegiance to it, and we need, we need prayer. And so I'm going to read the text, and then I'm going to pray, and then we'll open it. So here's the text, and if you if you'd like to follow along, it's John 8. If you want to reach for a pew Bible, the blue one there, it's 894, page 894. And if you want to just listen, that's fine too. So John 8, the Gospel of John, there are four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. This is one of them. And it's chapter 8, and we'll read verses 30 to 36. Keep your eye on the the freedom issue. That's my goal. I want, I want you to experience Christ as the source and content of your freedom. I want you to be free tonight. Here we go. Verse 30. As he, Jesus, was saying these things, many believed in him. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. They answered him, we're offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? 
Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave of sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So, if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. So, Father, that's what I want to happen here. I I would like to be an instrument in the hand of Jesus, the living, risen, sovereign Lord of the universe, an instrument in his hands to set people free so that we would walk out of here free indeed, free indeed, that is completely free, free in all the ways that Jesus means for us to be free and can make us free. And to that end, I ask that you would make me faithful to the Word because he said you'll know the truth and the truth will make you free. So the Son makes free and the truth makes free because the Son speaks the truth And if I could just be faithful, if I could just get this right, then perhaps, I pray it so, your grace would open the eyes of, like the young woman two years ago who who saw you when she was almost finished. And I thank you for her and for what you're gonna do now, in Jesus' name, amen. Now I take it for a certainty that everybody in this room wants to be free. Um, I mean really free, free in the fullness of freedom. And I know that some of you, us perhaps, are enslaved to things that are so pleasant, so enjoyable, you're saying to yourself, no, no, I really wouldn't. I I like this too much. I understand that. That makes sense. That we can be enslaved to something that is so pleasurable, the thought of being free from it's not attractive. So you might say, oh, you, you can take it for a certainty that everybody here wants to be free, but not so. Consider this, though. What you love is not the bondage. Oh, no, it isn't, and you know it. It's the pleasure. If you could have the pleasure and not be in bondage, you say, yes, (laughs) oh, in a minute. So I'm still banking on it. Everybody in this room wants to be free, deeply free. The opposite of freedom is bondage. The opposite of freedom is slavery. How many are going to raise your hand and say, slavery, that's what I want. Bondage. I'm all into bondage. Nobody. Nobody. We're on the same ground here. You and me, we want the same thing. I want to be free. The world is just exploding about this, isn't it, today? All over the world, this issue. All kinds of layers to this. So, verse 36, chapter 8 of John, verse 36. If the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. That means really free. Freedom is deepest at its its fullest. No half freedom, whole freedom, bottom freedom, down to the depths, up to the top, free. That's what we want. Now, this is Easter. And Easter is all about the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. And I just want to say here, he's alive. He rose from the dead in order that he might be alive forever. He reigns over the universe today at God's right hand as the image of God, very God of very God as the old creed has it. Death could not hold him. He came alive. He ascended into heaven, he reigns, he rules, he'll come again, he'll establish justice and peace on the earth, everything will be made new, and I say, hasten the day because this world is a mess. So he's gonna do that sooner or later. I'm not into billboards on Hiawatha that set dates, doubt that very much. 
But if it scares you enough to seriously consider him, then okay, let the wackos whack. (laughs) Now, in saying that about the Lord Jesus, uh, I'm taking a lot for granted here. (laughs) I know that. I'm just pronounce these things, things as though they were so, and, and if you're in that young woman's position and almost done with God, you might be very skeptical. So let me think with you for a minute about why Christians talk like this. Um, there are 27 books in the New Testament, you know, that part of our Bible. And we believe that those 27 books um, record true truth about Jesus. They, they tell the truth about Jesus. That's what they're all about, is Jesus. We think they're, they're true. They all assume or speak explicitly that he rose from the dead. All of those books either assume it or say it out loud. So there's just a uniform testimony in the New Testament they, that he rose from the dead. And, and we have to decide, now, what do, we, what do we do with that? That claim of these books that he rose from the dead, these 27 letters and gospels and acts and revelation. These 27 books are shot through with witnesses to the resurrection. I'll just read you one, since this is Easter and we should listen. So here's John 20, 27 and 28. Um, Jesus has come back from the dead, it says, and he has confronted his apostles who, who abandoned him. They were so afraid when he got arrested that they'd be killed too, they just fled. After three years of his loyalty, they weren't loyal. And he's meeting them, and he's not meeting them with any bitterness at all. He had none on the cross. He doesn't have any now. He is an incredibly amazing, one-of-a-kind person. Thomas, indeed all of them, were very skeptical. They, they were not gullible. And Thomas said, I'm not believing in this. If I put my finger in his hands, I might believe. Eight days later, Jesus shows up to, to Thomas. So that's what we're reading in verse 27 and 28. Jesus says to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands. And put your hand and place it in my side where the, where the spear went in. Do not disbelieve, but believe. And Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. So that's what you have throughout the New Testament is people having encountered the living Christ and they're testifying, my Lord and my God. That they t- we talk like that. Christians talk like that. Just, we do. That, and, and we do because we're in a line. We're in a line of people starting with those who saw him. And we just have to decide, okay, what, what are we going to do with that witness? These accounts in the New Testament are a thousand miles away from myth. Like Greek mythology and Roman mythology, which means it's all about the gods, and and there's just no connection with the real history of Greece and Rome. It's just way, way off there in la-la land, this mythology. This is just thousands of miles away from that because you've got Pilate, the governor, You've got Herod, the king from Galilee. You've got Caiaphas, the high priest. And history outside the Bible knows all about these people. This is real history. This is really there. It's not mythology, which which is why it's so vulnerable. Scholars can, can, can read this and just say it doesn't mean what we say it means or not, but they've got to deal with it. It's just there in history. Among the accounts, you have this consistent statement that these are eyewitness reports or dependent on eyewitness reports 
Paul, for example, who wrote, uh, what, 13 of the books of the New Testament, said in 1 Corinthians 15 that in his time, as he was trying to persuade the Corinthians to take the resurrection seriously, he said uh, he appeared to Cephas, Peter, he appeared to James, he appeared to the 11, and then he appeared to 500 people at once, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Now, why did he say that? He said it because they could just go ask him. I mean, just think of it. If you could do that, you could, I could give you 350 people to talk to who saw him alive after he was dead. That's pretty impressive. And that, that's the feel you get from these writers in the New Testament is that they were right there. Just picture the timing here. Just to, all I'm trying to do is press on you how distant this is from mythology. Picture the time frame. Paul's letter started to be written about 15 years after Jesus' death. The last one was written about 30 years after Jesus' death. Most of the letters of the books of the New Testament were written probably before 70 AD. It may be that John, this one, was written 90 or so AD. So they span time from, say, 60 years after Jesus died down to 15 years, which would mean, if we bring that into our situation, suppose we were the apostles, it means that for some of us in writing our books, Jesus was active in the late 80s, 1980s. Now, I'm 65. I've been here for 30 years at this church, almost 31. I know what happened in the late 80s. <laughs> and so do several hundred other people here. Or for others, it would be the 1970s. And for John, it might be the 1950s because he lived to be a very old man. This is not mythology. This is eyewitness memory. The tomb was empty. Picture yourself as the chief priests and the scribes and the Pharisees and the Herodians, all of them desperately afraid that this crazy cult called Christians is going to spread. And so, oh, let us find that body. Let us wheel that body in in a wheelbarrow to show this cannot make any headway. And they couldn't do it. They had all the authority to do it. And they couldn't do it because the tomb was empty and there was no dead body and if you were to think, which is what somebody in every generation writes a book about, when I was in college, it was the Passover plot, good grief. Every generation has to do this, try to reconstruct those days as though the disciples stole the body, hid it, made it all up, and then went out and died for it. Those disciples were so afraid that they abandoned him. They just left. We're not getting ourselves crucified. No way. Peter, I'll go to death for you. And he denies him three times. He's so afraid. And those people, within a week or two, are going to make up the whole New Testament mythology and then go out and be killed for it? This is absurd. It's as absurd as a resurrection from the dead, which is why so many scholars have written strong defenses of the historical event of the resurrection of Jesus. So I brought along a couple of books. Just a few of you, just a few of you care about scholarship. But for the few of you, you should know this. Okay, so now here's, here's a big, fat, 500-page book written by a professor of New Testament at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland named Richard Baucom. The title is Jesus and the Eyewitnesses, subtitle, The Gospels as Eyewitness Testimony. So here's my little place here at the end of the book and his summary. The Jesus of the gospel, the Jesus the gospels portray is Jesus as these eyewitnesses portrayed him, the Jesus of testimony. 
It took 500 pages to get there. So if, if, if you love really rigorous, careful, historical research, this is at Amazon, and then we're in John. This man, Richard Balkum, is so burdened to try to make his case that he did a whole book on the Gospel of John to the same effect. This one is called The Testimony, that's the key word, of the beloved disciple who wrote John, he argues, and the subtitle, Narrative, History, and Theology in the Gospel of, of John. And I don't know. Um, John has indicated that he takes seriously his own programmatic statement of the theological significance of real history. The Word became flesh. He intends to be faithful to the history. And then he tries to defend that. So if, if, if you like you know, to read this kind of rigorous stuff, Richard Bauckham, B-A-U-K-H-A-M, are, are available. What's the point of the last 10 minutes? The point of the last 10 minutes is that what we're dealing with in these claims of resurrection is the furthest thing from mythology. It's just so utterly rooted in history. It is so closely attended by hundreds of people. These hundreds of people are living as the New Testament books are being written. You can't get away with creating things when hundreds of people are looking over your shoulder who saw it all. You just can't. So whatever you make of that, at least make this. True or not, it's not mythology. Whatever you do, it's just not. It's utter history, and you just have to come up with some way of coming to terms with it, and Christians come to terms with it because we have met Jesus in these accounts, and he has simply won our trust. That's the way it happened. We met Jesus reading or hearing the stories, and he he proved himself to us. He stood forth as nobody speaks like this man. I can't escape from this man. I can't run away. I can't make him into a fool. I can't make him into a liar. This man is real. These testimonies are not jerks. They're, these people are not wacko. They're just witness. That's what they do. And, and witnesses have to just be believed or not. You can't prove history. It's not like math, two plus two is four. You can't prove history. You just hear witnesses, and then you decide, okay, is there good reason to embrace this, or, or isn't there? And, and that's where you all are. You're, you're on the brink of that decision. They, they didn't like Jesus' statement in verse 32. Here we are back in the text. It's all about freedom. I just took 10 minutes to try to de demythologize your ideas. Verse 32, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. And they answered him, and some of you might be saying the same thing, like, I'm already free, thank you. I, I could just go out of here now and, and that would be okay. Well, look at what happens when they say that. They say, we, we are the offspring of Abraham. We've never been enslaved to anybody. How is it you say you will become free? And so they're focusing on some aspects of freedom they already have. Thank you, Jesus. But we already have what we need. To which Jesus responds, um, verse 34, with an absolutely walloping statement that would take weeks to unpack. But truly, truly, I say to you, Everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. My, my, my. What are we going to do with that? All kinds of objections rise, don't they, in your heart? No way! That I, that I sin occasionally makes me a slave? No way! I trust him, and therefore I 
I, I shut my mouth and I said, okay, Jesus, go at it. I mean, if you, you say, if, if I sin, sin is something more than a mere act. Sin is a power making acts happen. That's what, that's what this slavery is. If you sin, that's not coming out of nowhere. He's, he is arguing human beings, because we all sin. This is a really breathtaking statement. We all sin, and therefore we're all slaves to sin, which means something's wrong at the root of us. That's what we Christians believe. Me, John Piper's got a root problem, not a superficial problem. Like, I don't occasionally do, th- do sin. I've got a root issue down here. This stuff is coming from somewhere. I'm a selfish person by, by root. My, my nasty words, my lack of patience, my self-exaltation, my preference for my pleasure over your pleasure, where's that coming from? It's like, oh, it just happened. It's coming from me and you. That's who we are. If we're honest, we know we're corrupt. We're just corrupt. We're selfish. We are selfish people. We're not living for others nearly to the extent that we, we should. So, we're slaves, he says. Sin is not just a bad act. It's the power that produces bad acts. We sin because we are sinners. So our slavery is slavery to sin, according to Jesus. That's the slavery that needs to be overcome. And it's too deep for us to overcome. And so the Son has to set us free. That's the point. If the Son sets you free, you'll be free indeed. And you can't set you free from your own corruption. You are who you are. But if the Son sets you free, there is a freedom Jesus gives that no one else can give. You can't give it. Nobody can give it. Only Jesus can give it. There are two ways that sin enslaves. Give them to you. And then then two kinds of freedom that come from it. First, sin enslaves by producing compelling desires. Desires that compel us to embrace this or that, think this or that feel this or that, do this or that. Sin is, is sure, it's a desire factory. It's just producing compelling desires. And the desires that sin produces are making anything look more desirable than Jesus. That's the definition of sin. Sin is the power that makes anything in life look more valuable than Jesus, which is why you choose those things rather than Jesus. That's what sin is. So the, the first way that sin enslaves us is by producing desires. And the way it produces desires is by making us perceive things, people, other than Jesus as more desirable than Jesus. And so we're locked. We're going to do what's most desirable. Jesus is boring, scary, mythological. This is real. And I'm going to do this. That's sin. It's also idolatry. All sin is idolatry. So that's one way that sin enslaves. Here's the second way. Eventually, if something doesn't intervene in that compelling desire and slavery, sin damns us. It destroys us. It sends us to hell. And I point that out because somebody might say, I'm okay with being enslaved to sin. It's just pleasurable, and I think my life is happier than yours, so bring on the slavery. You, you might say that. But I'm, I'm encouraging you not to because of this second way that you're enslaved. Namely, if you keep going in that course, you, you'll be destroyed. And that's not freedom. To choose a path that leads to destruction is not freedom. It's slavery of another and deeper and more scary kind. Now, Jesus frees us from both of these. There's two kinds of freedom here that that change. He frees us from that damnation by becoming a damnation for us. 
He lays down his life for the sheep. He takes our place. We sang about it. He paid it all. He paid it all. So Jesus went to the cross on Good Friday in order to become a curse for us, Galatians 3.13. So one of the testimonies of these books in the New Testament is this Jesus died intentionally in order that human beings wouldn't have to die and go to hell. He took our sin and he took God's wrath and therefore no condemnation for those who come to him. So that slavery to destruction is is gone. And then he comes into us by his spirit and new birth, it's called in this gospel, new birth happens and we have new desires. Suddenly, Jesus is more desirable than all that other stuff, innocent stuff and sinful, ugly stuff. Jesus is now more more desirable. Those two things. I will not be damned and I have a new treasure, Jesus. And we're free in those two ways. We're forgiven, the wrath of God is removed, we have a new treasure, and now we're free. Now, let me step back and do this. I wanna make sure that perhaps with a picture, I can make this memorable and plain. I'd like you tomorrow and maybe a week from now or a year from now to remember this message by the picture I'm about to, to paint for you. And what I'm after here is um, a, um, a situation that I'm going to describe that's contemporary rather than biblical as an analogy to the freedom that I want you to enjoy. And I'm going to argue that there are at least four levels to freedom, four levels or four kinds of freedom, and that if you don't have all of them, you're not fully free. We want to be free indeed. That's what I'm after, free indeed. So here's the, here's the picture. Um, Before I give you the picture, let me give you the definition of uh, full freedom. You are fully free. This gets it to four levels. You are fully free, completely free, when you have the desire, the ability, the opportunity to do what will make you happy in a thousand years. That's my definition of full freedom. You have the desire the ability and the opportunity, those are three kinds of freedom, to do what will make you happy in a thousand years. That's the fourth kind. Or we could say it like this. Experiencing full freedom is having the desire, the ability, and the opportunity to do what will leave you with no regrets forever. So, if you have the desire to do a thing, if you don't have the desire to do a thing, you're not free to do it. Now, you might say, oh, yes, I can. I can act against my desires. And when you do, when you act against what you really want, you call it freedom. Well, it is a kind. It's not the kind you want. Constantly frustrated, like doing what you don't want to do. Yeah, I'm free. No way. I don't want that kind of freedom. I want to do what I want to do. Then I'm free. If I have to constantly do what I don't want to do, I'm not free. If that was Christianity, I'm out of here. So, no way. You're free if you desire what you're about to do, and then do it. Secondly, if you have the desire, but the don't, you don't have the ability, you're not free to do it. I want to do it, I'm crippled, or I can't talk, or I'm, I just can't, for whatever reason, walk in a room, 
If you don't have the ability, you're not free to do it. Third, if you have the desire and you have the ability, but no opportunity, like you really want to have free speech. I have ideas, I can talk, but I live in Saudi Arabia. No opportunity get my head cut off or thrown in jail or something if I say what I really, really think. So you have to have desire, you have to have ability, you have to have opportunity. And then fourthly, this is the one that might throw you. If you have the desire to do something and you have the ability to do it, and you have an opportunity to do it, but it destroys you in the end, you're not free. You're not. You're not free indeed. To be fully free, you must have the desire, the ability, the opportunity to do what will make you happy, not destroyed forever. No regrets. If the sun shall set you free, you will be free this way and no other way. That is, there's nobody else that can do it. There's nobody else that can do these four things for you. You can do some of them, but not all of them. So now the picture. Skydiving. All right, I've never skydived, don't intend to skydive. If I were to talk too long about skydive, I would offend so many people about what I think about skydiving. <laughs> but I'm gonna use it as an illustration anyway. You want to feel the exhilaration of the freedom of falling Having jumped out of an airplane before the parachute opens, you want this very much, all right? You want that. What could be freer? 120 miles an hour. <laughs> so you, you get in your car, you head for the airport, and you hit a pothole on Hiawatha. And, and the tire blows out, and you run into a telephone pole, and you miss your appointment. So now you've lost the freedom of opportunity. Okay. This, is, this illustration builds. Gets better. <laughs> so you've just lost that freedom. You don't have the opportunity. You've got the desire. You've got the ability. Maybe. So second... Suppose you make it to the airport. Now, new situation, you make it to the airport. The opportunity freedom is, is there, and you've skipped all the classes. And you don't know the first thing about skydiving. You lack the most basic abilities of how to deal with a parachute. You don't even know how to put it on, let alone how to activate it. And therefore, the instructor won't let you go up. You don't have the necessary abilities. You can't do it. So you've lost that freedom. You got the freedom of opportunity, but you don't have the freedom of ability. Third step. Suppose you make it to the airport just fine, miss all the potholes, you've been to all the classes, and you know well how to do this. And you get in the plane, and you take off, and you're flying about a mile. I don't know how high you go, but let's just say a mile. And, uh, and they, they open the door, and you look out for the first time, and you lose all desire. <laughs> and you are struck with paralyzing fear, and you're not free anymore. You've got the freedom of opportunity. You've got the freedom of ability, and now you don't have the freedom of desire anymore. I'm not jumping out. And if they pushed you out, you wouldn't say that's free. Number four, you get to the airport just fine. You've gone to all the classes and all the ability is in place. You get up to cruising altitude and they open the door and you see the little tiny silos and farmhouses and square patches of land and you love it. Ooh, can't wait to jump out of this plane. And you jump. And as you fall, unbeknownst to you, 
your parachute is defective. It is not going to open no matter what you do. Are you free? Feels like it, as far as you know. No, you're not. You're doing this so happily. You're loving every second of it, and it's going to kill you. You are in bondage to destruction, gravity, hard earth. Very soon the whole thing, all the exhilaration will prove to be an illusion. In 30 seconds, you'll be dead. In order to be fully free, you have to have desire and ability and opportunity to do what you want to do, and in the end, no regrets forever. Otherwise, you're not free. We, in our free fall of life now, don't have any parachute. We have a Savior. And He has caught us mid-fall. And He has thereby become our supreme treasure. And He carries us all through life. We will, if we trust Him, mount up with wings like eagles. And we will be glad, we will be glad in a thousand years. Last sentence of the sermon. This message is not mainly information for you from God. It's mainly an invitation to you from Jesus. He's alive. He's in this room right now. And he's saying, if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. He is offering himself to catch you and carry you forever. Let's pray. Lord, I want to be free. I want my desires so changed into accord with reality that I can do what I want to do and never regret it. That's what I want. And so I'm hard after Jesus to change me because many of my desires are stupid. It occurs to me to say, Father, that we Christians would be utterly insane to envy people who pitch themselves out of the window of sin at the top of a skyscraper to enjoy a vapor's exhilaration of the free fall of greed or the free fall of drugs or the free fall of power or the free fall of fame or the free fall of sex or the free fall of job success and then death. We would just be insane to envy the world. Forgive us for our folly. And right now, I plead with you that everyone within the hearing of my voice would wake up from the dream world that that kind of free fall is freedom. Catch us, snatch us right now, I pray. And I pray this in the liberating name of the one who said, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. 
If the Son shall set you free, you will be free indeed. Amen.